So what I'd like to do this evening is just talk you through some of the, the work we've been doing around the treatment of, of claw horn lesions in cattle. Uh, the presentation is going to start with uh, some fairly philosophical stuff, actually, to give you an indication of, of where we are uh, as far as knowledge is concerned. Uh, then I would like to talk you through some of the work that Derek have funded with us at, at Nottingham in collaboration with Bristol, the RBC, and the SAC. Uh, and then finishing up towards the end, we'll talk about perhaps the way forward with some of this work and, and what the implications might be. Uh, just to introduce the claw horn lesions as, as a starting point, uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these lesions, uh, certainly at this level of severity. So here are the classic sole, the, the classic sole ulcer type lesions. Although I think it's worth saying, because it's going to become important for us as we go through the presentation, uh, I'm also going to be talking about uh, sole hemorrhage at the sole ulcer site in sort of the same vein. So if, as far as I'm concerned, these lesions that you're looking at now are just milder and or earlier manifestations of these more severe lesions that we're very often presented with when we're treating lame cows. Uh, but if we, we now are starting to get a little bit of a better understanding of the etiology of these conditions, and as far as I'm concerned, certainly sole hemorrhage at the sole ulcer site is just a, an earlier and or milder manifestation. And probably my gut feeling currently is that sole hemorrhage at other locations on the soul is actually part of the same disease complex. We just tend to see this lesion at the sole ulcer site. And it's not actually my intention to, to talk uh, too much about the current thinking on the etiology this evening, but if, uh, if we would like to talk about it at the end in questions, we certainly can. So it's those sorts of lesions I'd like to talk about as far as sole ulcer, uh, sole ulcer and hemorrhage are concerned. And then similarly with white line disease. So again, uh, we can see the, the more severe manifestations of this disease on the left-hand side. But of course, we also see mild manifestations. So here we've got uh, an obvious separation, slightly less obvious. And then perhaps again, under the same vein as, as with sole ulceration and hemorrhage, we also see these lesions here, which are the earlier and or milder manifestations. So here we're seeing so, uh, hemorrhage in the white line. And I'm now increasingly convinced that these are just the earlier manifestations of, of these conditions. Here we're seeing the, the injury or the insult, which is undermining uh, the white line, uh, which is eventually leading to separation and impaction of these lesions, leading eventually, uh, of course, to uh, abscesses under the soul if the lesion reaches the corium. But as far as I'm concerned, these are all the same condition. And actually, a lot of the work is suggesting that, that the underlying etiology for both uh, sole hemorrhage and ulceration and white line disease may well be very similar. There, are, there will be some small differences, but my current gut feeling is it's uh, similar underlying etiology. And I'm sure you're all familiar with those sorts of lesions uh, on, on feet. So I guess my first question for this evening is, is what do we know about treating claw horn lesions? What do we know about about treating these lesions. And if I'm honest, the slightly, um, the slightly fatuous answer to that question is, is actually basically nothing. Uh, and I hope as we go through the presentation, I'll be able to demonstrate why I believe that's the case. But of course, it does depend a little bit on what the question is uh, when we're asking, do we know how to treat these lesions? Because uh, of course, we can look at the question in many different ways. And so for this evening, my question is actually going to be something along these lines. In cattle suffering from claw horn lesions, what treatment or treatments lead to the fastest and most complete resolution of clinical signs and reduce the chances of relapse in the future? Because of course, that is also important. So that's the sort of question that I framed for this evening's presentation. Uh, my interest in this area really started a few years ago when we were, were charged by Dairy Co. to conduct a, a review of the peer-reviewed literature on lameness in cattle. And it led to some quite interesting findings that I perhaps hadn't, whilst I knew there was holes in the literature, I hadn't realized just uh, what a problem we were facing in some of these areas. And we ended up publishing this paper, which is a, a relatively recent publication. It was a systematic literature review, which we conducted on the treatment and prevention of lameness in dairy cows. And as always with these peer-reviewed uh, papers, uh, obviously a lot of them aren't open access, but you can always 
uh, ask directly or email me email me directly and if uh, if you request a, a copy of these these papers directly to the to one of the authors uh, you'll almost always be able to get these um, by return of email on, as, a, as a PDF even if they're not available freely online um, so what we did in this little small six-month study was to perform a systematic review of the literature I'm not going to go into a lot of details on uh, on what we did and how we conducted it but uh, we went for a fairly systematic approach to make sure we we picked up as much of the the peer-reviewed literature as we possibly could we used a number of search engines we used a great big string of search terms uh, the the search was because of, of basically financial constraints it was limited to 2000 onwards and it was conducted in 2011 so it covered an 11 year period it was uh, again because of, of constraints limited to English language only uh, and so we can we compiled this this quite extensive uh, database of of the peer reviewed literature on the treatment and prevention of lameness and what we ended up with was 608 papers in total uh, of those 284 so 608 papers on lameness in dairy cattle were available in the peer reviewed literature in the english language uh, over that 11 year period of those 608, 284 papers contained information on, on prevention and treatment. And there was a good spread through the, the papers on prevention. So uh, we had uh, papers in all areas that we looked at and classified them under. It was when we came to treatment that it, it provided some quite striking information. Because of those 608 papers, uh, there was only 31 which had any information on the treatment of lameness. Of those 31, 27 were on the treatment of digital dermatitis and we were left in this what I thought remarkable situation that of 608 peer-reviewed papers only three had any information at all on the treatment of the claw horn lesion sole ulceration and white line disease which we all know are extremely important and prevalent conditions there wasn't a single paper on the treatment of white line disease and if we look at the three papers which had been published on the treatment of sole ulceration and hemorrhage, if I'm honest, they weren't particularly useful in a clinical context. So there was uh, two sort of retrospective case studies on the, on the management of sole ulceration and hemorrhage. That didn't provide us with any new information. Uh, there was one very good quality uh, double-blinded controlled study published by Christoph Lischer et al. Uh, but it was actually on the supplementation of biotin for the treatment of sole ulceration. So as a sort of paper that gives us information that we could use clinically if I'm honest it didn't provide us with any information so over that 11 year period there was only these three papers published on the treatment of claw horn lesions so then I thought well clearly all the work has been done previously and if we extend that review of the literature uh, back further through the through the available literature we'll find the papers and actually we don't the only other paper that comes up if you extend that, that literature search of the peer-reviewed literature all the way back to the 1950s is this paper by Mike Pyman from Australia, Comparison of Bandaging and Elevation of the Claw for the Treatment of Foot Lameness in Dairy Cows. Uh, and that is exactly the sort of paper I would be interested in if I were trying to um, uh, use the peer-reviewed evidence-based literature in order to make decisions on the treatment of claw horn lesions. And with, that, with, with all due respect to Mike Pyman, because uh, fair play to him, this is the only paper I could find, this paper does have some quite significant flaws. And whilst it has some interesting information, it, it is uh, a little bit difficult really to translate the findings from this paper into a UK and a clinical context. So that really brings me to my, my first, my second question for this evening, which is, if that is the case and there is basically no information in the peer-reviewed literature on the best treatment of, of claw horn lesions or how we should go about treating claw horn lesions in cattle, what are we basing our current protocols on? Because it isn't available uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, so it ha but it has to be coming from somewhere. Well, of course, it's coming from the grey literature. So the grey literature is a term used to describe every other source of information uh, which is available which isn't peer-reviewed so this is the sort of textbooks expert reports per, um, expert opinion key opinion leader opinion that sort of stuff that is a, a, available in a range of different uh, formats and as part of that literature 
literature, literature review, which I've just talked about, we also actually reviewed some of the grey literature on the treatment of, of claw horn lesions. And these are some of the results we found. So we just went to as many sources as we could find. So we went out to a range of experts and asked them to identify sources that they were aware of, which contained information on the treatment of the claw horn lesions, cell oscillation and hemorrhage and white line disease. And what we ended up with was, was 14 uh, sources that had information on sole ulceration treatment and 15 sources which contained information on white line disease treatment. And then we reviewed those sources to see what sort of agreement we had across them uh, as far as the interventions that, that, that are commonly used for the, or we were aware might be used for the treatment of these lesions. And again, I hope you'll see straight away that, that even amongst this grey literature, there is a degree of, of disparity. The only thing that all of these sources agreed on was the fact that these, these lesions should receive a therapeutic trim. Uh, but we did have some quite striking uh, differences across the sources. So if we look at the application of a bandage for the treatment of sole ulceration, we literally had uh, two sources saying, yes, you should use a bandage, three sources saying you possibly could use a bandage, three sources saying you absolutely shouldn't use a bandage, uh, and five, what's that, four sources saying uh, not mentioning that as a treatment option. So even amongst the experts and, and other opinion leaders that wrote these sources, whilst there was some agreement on, on what we should do to treat these, these diseases, equally there was a great big range uh, of, of disagreement. Uh, and the other thing we, we absolutely have to acknowledge if we're using the grey literature um, as a source of information on what we should do to treat these, these lesions is that if we look on the evidence-based medicine hierarchy of evidence, with this sort of material, we are working right down here at the bottom of the weakest types of evidence, it's anecdotal and or expert opinion. Uh, that's the sort of level that we were finding, and that was basically the only information that anybody uh, working with dairy cows and treating lamb cows could use to, to, to formulate an opinion on what they should be doing. Now, if we were in the medical field, the idea that we would be treating tens of thousands of cows for what are quite serious lesions based on nothing better than expert opinion, uh, the medics would laugh us out of the building. I mean, it's, it's, it's frankly absurd that we're in a situation where around the world millions of cows are being treated for these lesions every year, and yet uh, we're basing those treatment decisions on nothing better than, than expert opinion. Uh, and, you know, I think we have to have to be very honest about, about what the quality of that information, uh, because it is fundamentally flawed. All that sort of anecdotal and expert opinion is, is, has, some, has some very profound problems with it. Uh, and it's basically because, uh, as, as, as clinicians and our operators, we are fundamentally incapable of objectively assessing our own clinical outcomes. It's been proven in a, in a range of psychological studies that th that is inherently the case. Uh, we're inherently incapable of objectively assessing uh, our clinical outcomes. There's a whole raft of physiological, uh, uh, psychological studies which have, have demonstrated this, and and have demonstrated a range of biases which exist in our own in our own thoughts on on how we judge our treatment outcomes. And probably for us this evening, the most important of them is, is confirmation bias, which was first de described uh, by Peter Wasson, uh, which is the tendency for people to immediately favor information that validates their preconceptions, hypotheses, and personal beliefs, regardless of whether they are true or not. So confirmation bias is, is basically a bias which we all inherently have, which means that we will all look for information that supports our current views. And that's fundamentally why it's, it's very difficult for us to be objective about the outcome of, of cows that we treat. Because if we've decided to treat a cow for that by a given method, we've obviously had some rationale as to, as to why we're using that method, i.e. that's our current belief uh, of what we should be doing. And therefore, if it's our current belief, confirmation bias would suggest that all we will ever do is look for information to support uh, to support that as a as a as an outcome 
and that isn't a criticism. I want to be very careful to say that that isn't a criticism of, of any of us. It's just inherently a, a fundamental part of the human condition. And that's just as true for experts and opinion leaders as, as anybody else. So the sorts of people that are writing uh, the grey literature uh, suffer from confirmation bias just as badly as, as everybody else. Uh, and so I sort of got to the point at the end of that review where I thought, well, if that is the case, you know, where is our information coming from? This is clearly a great big gap in the in the literature that we need to to try and do something about. And uh, I'm very grateful for, to say that uh, as part of the, the research partnership, Derek have, have been funding some work in this area so that we can start uh, trying to come up with more evidence-based approaches to the treatment of, of claw horn lesions. And this was the question uh, in some of the research that I'm going to describe now that we, we started with in cattle suffering from claw horn lesions, what treatment leads to the fastest and more, most complete resolution of clinical signs. So what we've been doing over the last 18 months is conducting a randomized clinical trial. It has got a positive control, which we'll talk about in a second, looking at the development of effective arm farm treatment protocols for claw horn lesions. Because again, I think it's important to say, what I'm not saying that what we are currently doing is wrong, what I, but what I am saying is that we don't know that what we are currently doing is right, or at least we don't know what the, the best treatments would be in any given situation. And I'm also certainly not saying that we've answered this question. And um, This is an incredibly complex area. There's a range of different diseases, manifestations of diseases, and a range of different treatment options available. We have just put the, one of the first pieces in the jigsaw in this area. Um, we've got a second study starting at Nottingham over the next month or two, which is a follow-on study. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that similar studies will, will now be conducted um, by other people in other locations, because this really is a gap that we need to fill in. So uh, what I'd like to do is now just play you a, a clip. I'll talk you through bits of it, uh, describing the methodology. It's a, it's a clip I put together uh, to visually describe the methodology. I think study methodologies can be incredibly dull um, on occasions, but I've, I've put this together to hopefully give you a, a better feel for what we've been doing. So as I say, the project was funded by Derek under the research partnership. I study designed a randomized clinical trial with blind outcome observation, uh, and there's the study hypothesis. So what we did was we went on to uh, all milking cows on five commercial farms, and we lameness scored them every two weeks using a slightly modified Dairy Co. four-point scale. We made it slightly more complicated uh, because we were using it in a research setting, and we wanted to increase discrimination. So we scored all these cows on the five farms every two weeks for a 12-month period. Cows became eligible for enrollment if they met uh, these criteria. So they had to have, they had to be a new case of lameness. So they had to, uh, on consecutive mobility scores every two weeks, they had to have go from being zero or one to a score of two or three. And then there was a range of exclusion criteria around antibiotic and anti-inflammatory use. If they met these cows, met this criteria, these newly lame cows, the foot was picked up and, and examined. We only wanted the claw horn lesions, so we excluded fowl and, and DD. We also had to exclude cows which had a lesion on both claws, so we were looking for, for single claw, claw horn lesions. So for example, we, we excluded these types of cows where they had uh, even very mild sole hemorrhage, uh, sole hemorrhage of the white line on both sides, those sorts of things. Cows which met the enrollment criteria were then, uh, were then enrolled onto the study. So all cows received a five-step therapeutic trim applicable to the lesion with which they presented. So uh, that was the first thing that happened. And then following that uh, therapeutic trim, the, the animals were randomly assigned to one of four treatment groups. So random allocation. So group one had no further treatment, and they acted as a positive control group. Group two had a that had that therapeutic trim and had a block applied to the sand claw. <coughs> Excuse me. Group three had a trim and a three-day course of the anti-inflammatory ketoprofen. And group four had a trim, a block, 
and a three-day course of anti-inflammatory. And again, I'm going to reiterate, that was random allocation. So they were randomly assigned to one of those four treatment groups. We then rechecked the animals eight days after treatment. If a foot block had been put on and it was no longer present, it was reapplied because uh, obviously we, we, we lost a few blocks, although it wasn't as many as you might think. And then importantly, four weeks after treatment, any cows which had had a block, the block was manually removed because we needed to do a blind outcome assessment at five weeks. And of course, if they had a block on, uh, the observer will be able to see that. So then all the cows were, were examined, mobility scored, by a blind observer uh, who had no idea what treatments they received five weeks after treatment. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the complexities of this study uh, in a little while, but, uh, but suffice to say this has and was a complete nightmare study to run. I now understand why uh, not many of these studies or any at all have been uh, conducted previously. Well, we don't need that again. So just to reiterate, what we were doing was identifying newly lame cows by mobility scoring. So they were enrolled if they went from uh, uh, two consecutive sound scores to, or, uh, sorry, two consecutive non-lame scores, so zero or one on the dairy cow scoring system, to a two or a three. They were immediately enrolled onto the study. Uh, we were looking for claw horn lesions in a single claw. So we ended up with three groups of lesions. So, for example, this cow was sole, uh, a sole hemorrhage on one claw. Uh, here we've got white Lyme disease on one claw. And then there was a group of other cows which had a, usually a combination of both lesion types, so both sole hemorrhage at the sole ulcer site and hemorrhage in the white Lyme disease in the white line. They were then randomly assigned uh, to one of four groups, positive to control group, which was a therapeutic trim only. Uh, group two had the therapeutic trim and a foot block. Group three had uh, a therapeutic trim and a three-day course of, of the non-steroidal uh, ketoprofen. And group four had a therapeutic trim, a block, and a three-day course of ketoprofen. We could then look at the outcomes to see if there's any difference in the, in the, uh, the treatment outcomes between those two groups. So in total, uh, there was uh, 1,100 cows which were mobility scored on those on those farms that we were using, and throughout that 12-month study period, 512 met the initial cri inclusion criteria uh, of going <coughs> identifiably lame uh, following a period of, of non-lameness. Of those 512, uh, unfortunately, only 183 actually met all our enrollment criteria. This is one of the big complexities in this study is uh, they are very difficult to run and we only actually managed unfortunately to enroll 183 although it has been enough for our purpose across those across those five farms I certainly don't intend to, to spend long uh, talking about the detailed analysis but we've now conducted some provisional, provisional analysis on the data set and it is also worth saying that we are still quite early uh, in the in the analysis period, we've got lots more to do on this data set. Uh, but it was a, a, a multi-level model conducted in a Bayesian framework, for those of you who have any idea what that means. Uh, so if we look at the provisional results, what we're going to be doing is comparing to group one, the positive control group, the trim only group. And what the, uh, the Bayesian, analysis, a Bayesian analysis does it gives us a, a percentage certainty. So it's not like classic uh, statistics where we're looking necessarily for a, for a p-value uh, of less than 0 0.05. What Bayesian analysis allows us to do is to, go, to, to it gives us a, a level of certainty that we can be in the results. Uh, and what the, the outcome suggests is that we can, do, we can be over 80% certain that cows in group two which received a block in addition to the therapeutic trim were less likely to be lame at outcome at five weeks. <clears throat> so we can be 82% certain. It was much less certain for the uh, group three, which received the trim and the three-day course of non -steroidals. We could only be 65% certain that they would be less likely to be lame at outcome. But interestingly, group four, which received both the block and the, and the non -steroidal, we can be very certain, 98% certain, that they would be less likely to be lame at outcome. Now, of course, what this doesn't tell us, or what I haven't uh, indicated to you in these results, is what the difference in uh, uh, response rate was, because, of course, that becomes important to us when we, when we look at the, the cost-benefit of these additional treatments. And it would be fair to say that, actually, we see uh, a high level 
of we saw a high level of recovery in treatment group one. So roughly, and, and uh, these are quite rough figures at the moment, 70% of, of cows in, in treatment group one that received the trim only uh, were sound outcome at five weeks. But what we do know is that uh, the, the groups, uh, the, the cows which, which received the other treatments, certainly the block uh, seems to lead to an improvement in recovery rate. And it's of the order of 10 to 15, 15%, which for a block I'm actually very comfortable with because a block, it, the, the new blocks now we've got, they take a couple of minutes to put on, they're costing five, six, seven pounds. It's not a massive investment. Of course, it's slightly more, uh, it's going to be a slightly more difficult decision with, with the cost of the non-steroidal treatment. Uh, but certainly the blocks seem to work extremely well in this study. Interestingly, I'll just briefly run through it. Uh, there were some other uh, factors which had a significant in the effect in the model. So uh, the season, uh, cows which were uh, lame in January and March had a worse outcome. Uh, diagnosis, so the diagnosis at the time of treatment, cows which had a multiple lesion were more likely to be lame at outcome. Um, the uh, lameness score at treatment, so the the higher the lameness score, mobility score at treatment was, the less likely they were to have recovered at five weeks. Stage of lactation, uh, further into lactation, uh, cows were less likely to be lame at outcome. So if you were further into lactation, uh, your chance of recovery was better. Uh, and lastly, parity. So um, cows in parity groups one and greater than four were most likely still to be lame at outcome. So uh, the, the response rate was better in parity group cows two and three. So uh, that is, it's just the first study, and I hope it will be the first of many studies, looking at um, uh, building up an evidence base for the treatment of the claw horn lesions, because it's a, it's a hole in, in the literature which we really need to fill. Millions of cows being treated for these lesions every year around the world, and we, and we really have no evidence base for what we are currently doing. Um, it's worth highlighting a, a, a few things about the study. Uh, which uh, I'm just acknowledging, really, because, uh, as I say, I'm, all I'm really saying with this study is it's the first piece in the jigsaw, but at least uh, we're starting to build up a picture. It's worth saying that these lesions were very early. We were taking cows <coughs> which had, had uh, multiple non-lame scores, and we were treating them as soon as they were uh, identified as lame. So most of the cows we were treating were both very mildly lame and had early and mild lesions. Uh, and that might not and doesn't necessarily reflect the sorts of lesions that, that, that are very oft we very often treat. I'm going to come back to that in a second. We did pick quite a careful case profile. These were single claw lesions, and of course I can't, be, I can't tell you for certain that uh, the results we gained can be extrapolated uh, into other lesions. But I was absolutely determined that if we were going to conduct this study, we were going to do it properly. Um, uh, what I didn't want to do was... Um, just add to the uncertainty, so we were very careful with our case definition. Uh, this study gives us no information on trim type, so we didn't try different types of trim, which of course uh, I know we'd all have different opinions on, on how some of these lesions should be trimmed. Um, we, we weren't blocking any clause with lesions, we were making sure of that, but I think probably more importantly, uh, that one of the questions that, that that uh, I've really thought about a lot since conducting this study is should we be taking blocks off? I think there's now quite a number of people who, who feel quite strongly that if, if blocks are put on as part of treatment, they shouldn't just be left ever to wear off. Uh, and I, I really think it's something we should be thinking more of, of about taking these blocks off three, four, five weeks after treatment. Of course, it gives us no information on the, on the type of block or the type of non-steroidal. Uh, and importantly, as we've briefly discussed, it doesn't really currently, uh, we need to look at the cost-benefit uh, analysis just to, to see whether there is cost uh, a benefit for these treatment interventions. Uh, I, again, I'm going to reiterate, uh, I really now genuinely appreciate why not many of these studies have been done previously. Um, I've been doing the, running these sorts of studies uh, with dairy cares for, for quite a number of years now, and I can honestly say this was the most complex and labor-intensive a nightmare methodology that, that I've ever been involved with, and I really feel for the, the, the postgraduates that, that actually conducted the work. It's a great credit to uh, 
Hetty Thomas and, and Juliana Miguel who uh, who conducted the work. <coughs> so that's the the the. the the, the first of the studies, I hope there will be many more to come, which will help building up the evidence base for the treatment of claw horn lesions so we can make better treatment decisions on exactly what we should be doing. And for the last five or ten minutes, I just really wanted to, to put that information into a slightly broader context uh, and talk about, for me, what has to be um, the route we're, we're really going down with the treatment of claw horn lesions. And as we go through, I hope I'll be able to demonstrate why I think this term early and effective is absolutely key for the treatment of claw horn lesions. Uh, this, ter this term early and effective was first first started to be used by my colleagues at Bristol and it, I, for me it's, it's quite a helpful and um, uh, helpful phrase to, to, for what we should be we aiming to do early and effective. So if we just briefly look at some of the, the research on in this area to see why I think we should be aiming for early and effective treatment. Firstly, uh, we know that delayed treatment is a risk factor for higher levels of lameness. So uh, there's been a couple of studies which have identified that delaying treatment um, is a risk factor for high prevalences of lameness on farm. Secondly, early treatment leads to more rapid recovery and less repeat treatments. Again, there's some really nice work uh, being conducted or conducted over the last few years by the Bristol Group, and they've really demonstrated that, that early treatment is beneficial. It leads to more rapid recovery. If we get in and identify and treat these cows early when they first go lame, uh, they recover more quickly and, and require less repeat treatments. Uh, it's also worth reiterating that animals which go lame in the first lactation are also much more likely to go lame in subsequent lactations. Again, I think there's some really good analogies to be drawn between lameness and mastitis. We're all familiar with the chronic high cell count, chronically mastitic cow. And actually, the analogies between that chronically mastitic cow and the, the chronically lame cow are actually quite good. And so similar to the to the chronically mastitic cow, once they've got a case which has, has really established itself, they're more likely to get a repeat clinical case in the future. There's some work demonstrating that, that animals which go lame in the first lactation are more likely to go lame in the subsequent lactation. Uh, I'll briefly touch on why that might be uh, in a few minutes' time. Uh, some work that, that we've just conducted at, at, at Nottingham, where we'll be publishing this as soon as we can, has demonstrated that the longer animals stay lame, the less likely they are to recover. So again, very similar to the chronic high cell count cow. Um, if they're not treated early, so they stay lame, they are then much less likely to recover. So it appears that if we don't treat these cows early, disease gets more difficult to treat. We also know that early and effective genuinely works. Here's the, the mobility score data for one of the five herds that participated in the, the randomized controlled trial, which I've talked about previously. So these are two weekly, uh, two weekly mobility scores throughout the study period. So when we first visited this farm, it was actually remarkably average for the UK. So it had just over 35% of its cows identifiably lame um, on the day of uh, on the day of assessment, 30% score twos and 6% score 